Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of This Week in Innovation. Today, I catch up with Brian, who's been on the road and giving presentations, and we talk a little bit about what's happening in retail and then get right to our guest. Give it a listen and let, let us know what you think. Hello, Brian. How are you doing today? Doing great, Dev. How about you? The stuff I'm seeing is just crazy how we're retail's evolving and its an approach to and use of technology. No, I couldn't agree with you more, Jeff. I mean, it's, what's really interesting is that things that we talked about that are going to be trends and are going to be norm uh, is actually norm now, especially after the pandemic, right? How fast, look at how fast digital is growing. And there is so many changes happening. And it's amazing to see that there is an embrace of these type of new forms of technologies by leaders, especially from traditional companies to uh, to create better growth and have consumers engaged more deeply. I understand you gave a keynote last week. It was great. It was great. It was I, I did the starting keynote at the Western Michigan Food Marketing Conference. So I don't know if you know that the Western Michigan is is one of the leading universities in terms of the food program. They have America's number one food undergrad and they deeply work with a lot of food distributors, manufacturers. Pepsi is a big sponsor, so Indra was there in that in that event she gave a um, as a talk as well, a lot of leaders from several different food brands, Conagra, Kraft, all the leading CPG companies were all there. And the topic that I spoke about, which I know we, we cover a lot in our <laughs> podcast, is this whole idea about why 2023 is going to be a, such a pivotal year. Because it goes back to this whole concept of all the forces merging and how it's going to become real. We've walked through the journey of how uh, larger traditional brands can leverage all this innovation that's happening in the industry, right? You don't got to be an Amazon or a Facebook to do all these things, right? Yeah, it's great. They spend 36 billion a year in R&D, but they are making the market. But for you to make meaningful changes for in consumers' day-to-day -day life, you don't need to spend that kind of money because everything that you need is already there. The startups are there producing the technology. The leaders are quite getting familiar with all the business cases, the use cases where it's applied. And there are enough integrators, vendors, platform, low code, all these things are there to make all these things real. And I showed a lot of practical examples and, and I got a lot of interest from several leaders. What they were really excited about is not just the fact that all these trends are coming, this wave is coming, everything is going to be, 23, 23 is going to be a pivotal year, everything is going to be changing for good. But however, what they were really impressed is the fact that they can do something about it. They can be a participant, not a spectator. Fantastic. I look forward to really delving into your pitch maybe the next time around. But today we have a very special guest, Gwen Morrison. Gwen, thanks for, for jumping on the pod with us and feel free to introduce yeah, yourself. Me. Yeah, so I, I describe myself as being focused on the intersection of retail experience, brand activation and innovation. And I've spent a good part of my career in the advertising business. Uh, more recently, for about 15 years, I was a uh, CEO of WP's Global Retail Practice, and um, we were looking at just helping our clients and agencies navigate the dynamic retail landscape that's been driven by, you know, digital transformation and shopper adoption of technologies. So in that role, I've worked with major international brands across retail formats for CPG and QSR and financial services, travel and automotive. So really everything, is, unless it's B2B, is retail. So we look at it in that broader perspective. And over the years, I've been speaking at you know NRF and CES and uh, being writing uh, certainly about putting up thought leadership pieces, advising retail startups. I'm an Endeavor mentor. And we'll talk a little later, uh, senior advisor to Open Voice Network as well. I keep do partnership. I do advisory work, but I really am passionate about I'm helping some of the um, newer retail tech startups to really, you know, accelerate, um, you know, their growth and uh, business opportunity. And I'm that Wayne, you are an advisor to iterate as well. <laughs> I've just well, signed that. I've just joined your Iterate team. Very excited about that. And we can really look for some terrific work ahead of us. Thank you. Fantastic. You sound like a, a the perfect person to bounce off Brian and I. So what do you see the key retail trends playing out that retailers should be paying attention to? 
Sure. It's just come off of it's been an interesting time after the big shows going dark for about a year and a half and then coming out like the Wizard of Oz coming out. <laughs> And they were in the real person-to-person -person CES and the National Retail Federation and the NRF's big show. And uh, there were similarities, obviously, with the NRF having the focus on retail. But we see a lot of more of like an evolutionary phase right now. A lot of technologies that had been, you know, present and, and promoted still there, but maybe looking at bringing them together more harmonizing technology would be a way to think about it. How do you cobble together some of these solutions so it's a more comprehensive, more focused journey with these different types of technologies? How to leverage what you might even call dormant act assets. If like all cameras might have a microphone, but we haven't used the microphone. So how do you start to tap into what existing asset that companies have and then expand and do more with it? So that, you know, humanizing and harmonizing technology was really, I think, a big theme and something we're going to see more and more of. There's been a lot of talk, of course, about the metaverse, and we're still we're seeing these companies really experiment in it. And some of these one offs seem silly. And then some of them look a little more interesting when you think about trying to create a metaverse store it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the metaverse like can go forward and backward in time and there's no gravity. And so like creating a store through a metaverse experience is a little bit strange. But we've seen, especially in the beauty categories, some of the companies, um, like SD Lauder with like Clinique doing some loyalty programs where they're looking at literally like having people chime in on what they believe to be the core values, um, the ethos, if you will, the Clinique brand, and then bringing that into some NFTs that you might Burn. This NFTs and, and metaverse has been that sprinkled all over on um, these shows. And so it's early days, but it, it's, it's interesting to see how, especially with the younger audiences, brands are looking at creating platforms that engage through gaming and creating these virtual worlds and things like that. But I think we go back to connecting the dots through the physical and the digital and getting some of those choke points out. And that's been part of my interest in voice because we have so many of these devices that don't connect with one another and shopping assistants that don't connect. So there's not, without an interoperability component between these worlds, it's very hard to have a cohesive um, shopper journey. And then let's add a motive into that with more places to do tasks that are hands-free. So there's such a future in trying to, again, take the friction out of, we have consumers adopting technology, but we, so we have to look at what's in the way of that working across devices and platforms. Interesting. I'd, I'd like to follow up a little bit on your observations on the metaverse. So I typically really don't chase a lot of hot trends until I think there's real technology behind that. The idea of the metaverse was, I don't know, initially I was a little, uh, seems a little silly, but then I started thinking about it. And I'm a pilot. I've been, I've had heads up displays for 25 years, which I would argue is a metaverse. I'm a huge fan of AR, augmented reality. Again, just that's a glass cockpit. So there's a bunch of pieces of that technology that are already out and about. And so as I thought through and got away maybe from the, I don't know, careful how I say it, but maybe the silliness of what, what Meta, Meta is trying to do, which I think is a little silly, to the retail play, I've gotten a lot more interested. Have you placed a bet yet? Do you think this thing's going to really take off? I hear what you say about the store. We'll see. But other pieces, what are your thoughts? I think from retail perspective, I think the industry is still trying to figure out what's going to be the stickiness of this versus just gaming and experiential playtime where brands want to be a part of that time of a consumer's day. We're all trying to be a part of a, the consumer's life in any way that we can engage. And so if uh, consumers are spending a lot of time gaming and now the metaverse is amp that up as an experience, sure, well, look, how do you get the brand in there? In terms of the shopping, it's very early days and hard to tell. I like Nike has done this. You wear the shoes in their Nike land metaverse environment. That's an interesting, you could call that a trial or a tribe for you. <laughs> or like to to keep it really aspirational. Here I am wearing things. I could maybe be in a fashion show. The 
situations are endless. It's really all it's the create. It's about the creativity that you have and imagining how your brand plays in that space. But I think the getting it into the retail component is still really early days. I have to say. Yeah, and I love the fact that we're experimenting. That's whether it whether it really takes off or it doesn't. Just as an analyst, it's been cheerleading the idea that retailers need to be more innovative. I love that piece. And so it'll be fun to see. Jeff, what also happens is there's a lot of campaign style experimentation because a lot of the teams that are leading a lot of these metaverse initiatives are brand or marketing teams. So they are, they, are, they are doing what they are usually very good at doing, run campaigns and figure out KPIs around these things and do some experimentations. But eventually, as the trends pick up, there might be some more platform-oriented, larger initiatives that retailers and others might engage. But now I think a lot of campaign initiatives that you're seeing, testing things out, Gwen said, the Nike scenario and a lot of those cases, which has been interesting. I don't know if the Chipotle had the whole... Uh, the burrito giveaway. They did it. They did that in the, in an established platform. So when you do that in established platforms, people just rush in, and there was like a million plus kids just rushed in to get these free burritos. And then of course the site crashed for a while. But then there's a lot of these stories. It was really interesting to see the excitement that's beginning. Beginning, right? Yeah. The, two, the earlier point. I think if you might look at some predictive analytics based on the behaviors that consumers show as they navigate these metaverse experiences. Can there be a way to migrate that into a digitally enabled physical environment? So you could start to take components that seem to be really successful and then move that into a store situation. So I think the observation of how people are navigating and interacting with brands in a metaverse type of landscape becomes quite interesting. It could be a test and learn and playground. Like test and learn a lot. Yeah. yeah. One thing, Gwen, I want to go back to one of the points that you were talking, especially about the habits of being digital, being 30, 40% and people interacting and buying more through e-commerce and uh, especially with the pandemic. A lot of retail leaders that I've spoken to are wondering and having this question because our habits and as consumers, as well as workers and employees and leaders, have changed over the pandemic. So things like working from home, expecting fresher, frictionless ex- experiences in the store, interacting more with commerce, uh, e-commerce and digital experiences. And mm-hmm. if something is frictionful or like where we have to do it through a very long process, then we abandon it. So because of the pandemic and the habits of generated through pandemic, what trends are you, are you, do you think are here? What is going to be the sand which will quick sand which will change as, mm-hmm. like you said, like people are now start to, to, to travel back? What sections are going to be wet cement that will eventually turn into concrete? And mm-hmm. that just completely changed the world uh, yeah. of consumers and retail. Well, I don't think we've seen uh, obviously this hyper acceleration adoption of e commerce and retail and the demand for um, convenience in ways that we wouldn't have imagined just a year and a half, two years ago. And so it's now like getting all uh, connected and saying, now how can technologies, okay, we solved for, I call it, we saw a, a new definition of mission shopping during the pandemic because it was like, mission number one is get in that Costco as quickly as you can and get out of there with what you need. That's So that's not aspirational shopping. That's just like getting stuff. On the flip side, we saw a lot of really interesting embrace of uh, Pinterest. Again, more idea-driven, aspirational kinds of idea of shopping for making your home a better place, making your home office a better place. So there's been from a consumer perspective, point of view, a reassessing of everything, like, where do I want to live? How do I want to live? What's important to me? And so now it's like, how do you meet that moment where the consumer is rethinking their habitual shopping patterns and their, and their, to your point, the, the way that they work and the way that they live. And I think that the next level will be, again, stitching things together. So Let's say you sit, take any situational shopping mode. Is, let's say I'm in a parking lot of the Costco and there was during pandemic a wait out the door and people lined up to get in. How come, why don't I get, why isn't the geolocation technology recognizing that the shoppers in that zone, right within proximity of the store and start putting together the basic list of replenishment items so they get them all the time so that what they would see in the store would be 
more about that dreaming and seasonal products and things that make us think about lifestyle and not the stuff that we need all the time. That stuff could actually be in the back of the store. You don't even have to see it. If there's a SKU that you buy these 15, 20 SKUs every single time, that store of the future could reallocate space totally so that you're only seeing the seasonal merchandise, the inspiring products that are new, and that basket could be put together in the back. So I know a lot of brands, you know, like Coke and um, many more have, have thought about that even before the pandemic of how the store in the future with automation and um, personalization, and then that physical rec recognition of what proximity is the shopper to the location, you can reimagine a shopping experience. I think that's where we have permission to go there faster. Perfect. No, that's definitely very interesting. I think it also like you said, probably creates a deeper engagement and being able to cater to the shopper at, 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 at to a one-to-one -one level opposed to the sure. broad targetings. Yeah, no, that's I also different. think there's pressure on just making the experience of shopping online better. It's still catalog clunky. The search is never smooth the way you want it to be. You put in a, you click key in a men's blue dress shirt and you get a few blue shirts and then you get a dress and then you get yeah. a red dress ultimately and a, and a black shirt. It just doesn't, it's not smooth. And some of the, if you can take some of the, the elements of voice that we've talked about a bit, just can I say that because I can say it and more smoothly than I can key it in, but connect to a visual search that responded to that. Where we, again, haven't brought on um, these different technologies together in a way that really works fully around the consumer journey. And I would say, if you really amp that up, why can I be like, I'm like in my closet, I'm looking at something, I really need a, you know, this new type style black cocktail dress for this event I'm going to. And you'd say that, and then you would see on a screen, some examples of options. And then you narrow that search. And why aren't we now in an AR or VR kind of situation, experiencing my avatar with that dress on the runway. And why not set to some music that I like from my habitual preferences anyway, and create that experience. So we don't really, we don't have that at home yet. And we really don't even have that in the store. And I think all those um, technologies and innovations are there to, to do that. And probably if we look to the East and to the Alibabas of the world, we've seen much more of that integrated in um, social contexts, making a party out of something. We buy eight dresses together, we get a discount. Having that, those this, the live streaming, which is happening more and more in the US, but still limited and bringing celebrity to that experience to that, and then even syncing that with a seamless payment system. That's the future of where we should be headed. Yeah, I've really gotten religion on that. I'm just with a couple of the guests we've had in the last six months, really looking, I guess, like most Americans, I've so focused on North America and Europe. I haven't really paid a lot of attention to, to the rapid evolution of retail in China um, and in Asia Pac. And boy, oh boy, they're what, at least five, six years ahead of where we are. And think about there was a reason that people, China moved people to, around the country at rapid speed to put them into different you know, jobs and housing. And they created city. They, they were able to move people very quickly to respond to, in great part, the tech rush and the boom, I should say. And then the retail wasn't where the people were. There was a real opening to accelerate that. And of course, some brilliant people to make it happen that really embrace the needs and the, the, the way that the adoption of technology that was necessary. Payments through phones, et cetera, were needed. They didn't have physical banks and where they were living and working. So it's really just been a, you know, a perfect combination of trend and need and technology. Yeah, absolutely, Gwen. I think what's really interesting in Asia, especially China and Japan and other Asia-Pacific Asia countries, what's really interesting is that they had a lot of the payment, mobile-related payments, paying, paying through apps, and also this whole concept of super apps. So you just have one app, 
and you can pretty much get your Uber in it. You can get your shopping done in it. So you have one app, the super app techniques, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of those things came like several years ahead and then they, they become the main trend. So today, one of the problems that we see, Jeff, a lot of leaders that we speak to, a lot of seen leaders struggle with is that you can't innovate fast enough because the POS is still very old school and it doesn't integrate to anything. And that's a big struggle with a lot of IT organizations. And a lot of those things have been leapfrogged in, a, in China. So because of the systems are modern, they're able to connect a lot of th those things and they can enable a lot of the connect connective points like, you know, buy in the store, get it delivered, you know, order online, pick it up in the store. Those all comes naturally to them opposed to trying to, you know, connect and glue up a bunch of things that don't work together, like the U.S. retailers are facing. So we, we do say, look to the East. We want to see what is coming to the West. <laughs> I agree. For oh, sure. <laughs> Gwen, you said a couple of times, I used the word voice, and voice is one of those very interesting technologies that an analyst like myself always gets interested in because you have these small little players like Siri. That definitely gets the analyst's attention. But I'm not sure I, I know where voice is going from a retail perspective. We've had a couple of, uh, or we've had, Brian, what have we had? I think we've had two, two uh, startups that are doing work around voice. I'm curious yep. what your take is. You've got a, a more seasoned eye on that. So is this, is voice something in retail I need to worry about? What does it look like? What are, where are we sitting with voice right now? Sure. First of all, a lot of people in the industry have come together under this um, umbrella. It's called Open Voice Network, which is a nonprofit group um, started. I think it was launched informally maybe about three or four, four years ago. And more recently in the last two years, got the support of Linux Foundation. And there were really a lot of different retailers and brands were stakeholders in this commerce space. Looking at the some of the issues of privacy, some of the problems with the data capture that might be happening through a particular sit called Amazon's Alexa's listening to you know everything you're saying in your home, and, and there could have been one particular concern of let's say you were a brand that you, a consumer thought you're building a basket at that store, and then it just gets fulfilled by Amazon, but by, by, you know, virtue of the fact that you're communicating with their device, you might just the hijacking component. So there are uh, a number of people gotten together, companies that are trying to lead, trying to look at establishing standards. There are no industry standards, really. So it's very early days, like World Wide Web, even, you know, where there just weren't any type of standards. And they've taken the bull by the horn to work together, groups of technologists, some amazingly brilliant people to establish how that could work. They have a number of different groups. There's some have been running a um, co-leading a commerce community. And the challenge, commerce and retail are probably behind some of the other applications of voice. So we've seen the numbers that are tremendous, the number of device, voice devices that people have brought into their homes. Everyone has a mobile phone. That's a voice device. And the use of voice on a daily basis for maybe getting information, finding out what's the weather. Obviously, people in driving cars are getting directions. So it's a very like functional usage right now when you look across the board. Commerce, we the term conversational commerce was put out there at least like four years ago. And it's a little misleading uh, because we're really not having shopping conversations. We're really, you have to almost think differently about it's, is it a conversation with someone or are you using your voice to as a command, as a tool? So I think there's been, there hasn't been the acceleration of, voice-driven shopping to the extent that there's been an acceleration of voice-driven everything else. But a lot of uh, retailers, and particularly like in the QSR space, are starting to look at those different ways to integrate voice into ordering systems. Obviously, you order like manually through a speaker at a drive through but there's many more interesting ways that you could create um, efficiency and reduce some of the less desirable interactions if that you can smooth out those processes. So I think the big brands are investing in independent voice assistance. They're very looking at voice as um, a feature. You think about how you can put voice into a, a larger ecosystem. And I think it's important to think that way versus just using voice as a solution. Because right now, are you having a conversation with a consumer and then it doesn't really get your 
what you're trying to say. So there's actually more pitfalls right now if you try to bring it as a full up solution conversationally versus thinking about tasks and commands. So there's a whole world for, I think, brand marketers to start navigating. And I know some of them are using it early days and the maybe on the operations side as people work together for inventory. There have been some pilots in the grocery space having to do with wayfinding. You know, that picker who comes in from Instacart could speak and locate something faster. That's an interesting play. We've seen some early tests with uh, shoppers finding that, especially people with special needs. There are people that really they get lost in stores and they spend hours and hours finding things in a grocery store. And the indicators are, and this is very early days, but a voice component that assists them through navigating that store can greatly enhance their experience and reduce the time it takes to buy things. You really have to look at things a little bit one off and say, how is voice part of a bigger solution? Wow, that I hadn't really thought of the ADA play to that. That's fascinating. Yeah. I think my wife would probably like me to have a voice assist through uh, Costco. I'd probably spend less on, on some, of the, focus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, of the, some of the things that I've come home with. And also, Jeff, what's really interesting is to Gwen's point, like a lot of the, especially in retail, like there's a lot of these really interesting one-off cases. A company that I met, a, well, I think a last year or the previous year, that had a really interesting retail technologies where, technology where they ended up using the existing microphone that's in, and the speaker that's been used, headset being used by the associate, mm-hmm. but then enabled voice on top of it to do actual, very similar to second screen and app, like recommendations, right? So you could ask something right there and like, what do you, you know, is this available in stock? And bam, they will tell you and it'll, and then if the associate doesn't know with certain clicks, they can put it to the automated system and that'll respond in real time. Wow, interesting. Right? So you can have a lot of a selling assistant capability, which is really interesting too. Yeah. And then it is all transparent to the consumer. Very right? interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Brian, is Iterate doing anything with voice? We are. We are involved in a, quite a few voice projects. So one of the things that we've been telling a, a lot of retail leaders in voice, the first thing is that voice is a very competed, competitive gateway, right? What I mean by that is uh, that when in the early days, if you were a com- e-commerce website, you wanted to get the right domain name, right? You want to say, be like, you know, www.target.com. You got to have the right domain name. Now, if you look at the Amazon devices and the Alexa device and the, the Google devices, there is an activation keyword, right? There is a keyword that you say, start. Or you could say, if I say her name right now, she'll start right now. So I'm not going to mention the name, but you, you basically say, Miss Device, please activate the WPP app or the target app. So that, that entire activation keyword is actually have to be procured ahead of time. Especially a lot of brands don't not only want to have their brand name keyword, but say you are in the pet industry or you are in the, one of the companies that we work with is in the uh, industry of providing fertilizers and grass seeds and everything, right? So they have an Alexa app called My Lawn Helper, Activate Lawn Helper. But that word is a common word. So there are like hundreds of companies that are in the lawn that are in some all the way from lawn carpets to companies that sell weed backers would try to get that keyword. So if we're trying to help come leaders understand like, okay, your brand is fine. You can always get target. But then the challenge you're going to have is all these other keywords, these activation keywords you want to look at and put apps in the beginning. Because think about this, right? Google is the search, is the gateway for your search online, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Facebook is your gateway for your social network and then all the associated TikTok and everything around there. But then similarly, Amazon's your gateway for commerce. And similarly, you have Alexa, is your gateway for voice at home. So you are a retailer, you want to get into this rate in this into this gateway as a marketer, you want to get into all these touch points of the gateway. So first we encourage a lot of folks to experiment. We already have like a voice framework built into our low code platform in a play. So you can just drag and drop and that's already a template to build a very simple like you know what are, what time is the store open? What are the product listings? I want to I want to reserve a product right last night my my little one is really uh, into reading this graphic comics uh, comic novels. So she she's following this book called The Five Worlds. It's a little kid's eight year old uh, you know comic book. So it came in, and so we called the Gilroy store. Guess what? There was only one book that was left in the shelves. 
So we use a voice mail, like a regular voice call, old school phone call. <laughs> and then well, I was in the line for 15 minutes to reserve. That could be a simple Alexa message. You could say, Alexa, activate Barnes & Noble book reservation and activate a book ISBN, reserve it for me for two days. And here's my phone number, yeah. right? So those are things that can become very seamless. So that's something we're encouraging, which get into the voice. We're encouraging them to get into voice. The other thing that we're also doing is more advanced cases, like because of frictionless. And I know you, as, um, as you are already aware, we are powering a lot of the convenience stores and uh, companies in the gas and automobile industries create you know, computer vision-based cameras and capture and do license plate recognition and, and automatically do uh, fuel pumping without any without having to authenticate themselves so in the same vein we're also looking at voice right how can you use your voice because as connected vehicles are having voice features naturally enabled right the apple the, the car platform and all the other stuff from ford and other manufacturers they all have voice capabilities open and, they, and also alexa it's also licensed into all these platforms as well so how do you actually tap into that and create connected commerce capabilities so that's another area we are looking at voice and when you think about machine learning and AI is really at this point baked into everything, yeah. um, and whether it's a retailer, you know, or any type of company, it's real. It's become foundational. If they're not seeing it that way, they're behind already. But so that if you look at voice as part of a larger ecosystem with AI at the core, then you start saying, what? How does that the learning build on the use cases for voice? And to your point in automotive, those situations where maybe hands-free. What's the opportunity when I need to be hands-free? What's the opportunity to connect voice with the visual? And on the, of course, the hardware behind. We, if I think about LG when they put the t, the screen into the refrigerator a couple of years ago with voice could be a component of that and like an in-home cooking interaction. That's a brand opportunity right there. But it's not just voice driven. It has to be contextual and it has to be use that insight, the data that you have from the consumer journey to make it be appropriate in the situation, time, right place, like everything else. Wow. Really interesting. Yeah, I fully agree. Yeah. I completely agree. I think it's really interesting because I think the other thing that's also happening in Gwen and Jeff is that, that as connected vehicles are coming in into the picture, and I think California 2035, you cannot drive a gas vehicle anymore. And that sort of legislation is coming in lots of different states. And then the challenge with electric is that the charging technologies are still fully not there yet. You, you have a Tesla, you can run a supercharger, but then you still have to be not everywhere you have a supercharger. And then all the other manufacturers are making vehicles that are using charge point or any other charging capabilities. So when you are parked in these places, getting charged across going from one destination to another, the whole voice interaction becomes really interesting because you're spending a lot of time in the vehicle and, and voice becomes more and more in the hands-free experience. And the other thing is about all this stuff, it's Gwen was saying that the cooking experiences, all those things, but there, there is a cooking brand. We work with a brand. Uh, I, I think Shiv was here, like Pampered Chef. You're probably familiar Jeff being interviewed with Shiv. So they have a, they, they sell cookware through a direct selling mechanism. But, they, but it's all based on recipes and experiences. So as consultants are making these recipes, all those things can be put on, on Alexa. And it becomes super exciting because now it's just a one word pull for all these recipes. And that's why I think this is very powerful because the other thing also is really interesting is a lot of these devices that were voice. Earlier, when they first started, they were just voice. Now, like in my office, I have an Alexa sitting here that's the Alexa show that actually has visuals to it. So you could actually pull a, ask for a recipe. The, the voice will tell you what to do. But at the same time, on your device or if you have an Alexa show or on your TV, it can push a card and the card can have the physical recipe. So you have this a synchronous and asynchronous experiences nicely stitched together. And I can pull the card later on, five minutes later, okay, now I missed this part. Why do I, I don't need to ask her to repeat again. I can just look at, which I think is really interesting how they've taken something, you see, because voice experiences are what I call synchronous experiences, right? And everything you find in digital emails and reading things, asynchronous experience. But with this type of thing, with, with, with this type of card pushing, tech, pushing, card pushing technologies, they built it, made stitch them together. Now you have synchronous and asynchronous, which is really cool. Wow. Wow. 
So what I'm hearing from both of you is I need to really ramp up my uh, thinking around voice because I'm probably behind the curve, at least behind the, the thought leader's curve. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I think we should do more voice podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and we should invite more of Gwen's friends uh, in the voice, on the voice, Open Voice Foundation. It, I think they're doing a tremendous job, yeah. It is an open invitation for sure. Last question, Gwen, is Open Voice Network, is that verticalized or is that really just an, an, an open platform and commerce is, is a clear kind of... This you know, is not a platform per se. This is a really a group, group of thought leaders who are trying to look at issues and opportunities around voice. And when you say vertical, yeah, we do have the commerce community. Probably what could be further, as far further along would be the healthcare community because that's a space where, whether it's within the um, four walls of a medical facility where voice can both um, help things happen faster, more accurately, or where there's more listening, like a patient who could be in a hospital room, is there are sounds that indicate they have certain needs and maybe to augment what the regular capability of the staff is. There's just endless use cases for that. The other area that we didn't really touch on and, and so much of the technology um, that we've seen in recent years in CES has application for is elder care or accessibility tech. Voice and AR and VR and all of this can be pulled together to imagine a setting for an elderly person um, who needs to be monitored, who needs to be able to call out for certain things, who maybe there's a remote relative that gets informed of different situations. There's just endless application when you think about how this technology can surround um, someone with health issues or aging at home needs to make that a much more safe and a possible you know, situation for them. Wow. That's some, that's an example I think literally all of us can relate to. I mean, it sounds like it's going to be ready by the time I'm going to need it. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, the last couple of questions for you. What advice would you give for young entrepreneurs? Like, and you mean in startups, startup one thing I, I would say is stick with, with when you have a concept and you've really done your you know homework around the viability of this, the white space for this, the use case, uh, et cetera, the, what will the, the market possibilities be to really stick with it? Because it takes time, I think, to get the uh, attention of the investor community and to, to really sell things in. So I'd say give yourself a little more um, runway than that. Uh, you expect. I've seen too many entrepreneurs, maybe six months out, say, wait a minute, this isn't happening as fast as I thought it was happening. So maybe we take our team and figure out what else we can do with the assets and the talents that we have in our team. And then the investor community looks at that, that the, the term pivot is not always a great thing when you're the entrepreneur. It's a good thing if you're a, an older retailer, but not if you're the entrepreneur. It really, I'd say if you have a passion and belief for what you're doing and you think you're going to have a high impact in the industry and create growth and, and an opportunity for others, stick with it. Don't pivot. Yeah, unless you're slack, then that pivot was well, very lucrative, but yeah, point taken for sure. Yeah. Last question. What skills that you use today do you wish you would have paid more attention to back in the early part of your career or even back in college? I don't know. I don't know about the skill. There's such, been such a change in the, of what's out there and how we work. Certainly, if you look at the advertising industry and how that's evolved and I've been working for 40 years, so I, I can't pinpoint it on a specific piece of knowledge, but I would say just feel good in your own skin and be confident. I think that's something that's hard to teach in college. I felt like I learned a ton that really helped me. And I, ha I happened to go to a school, an unusual school, Hampshire College, you might have heard of it, where it's, it was all looking at your mode of inquiry, looking at putting your own program together. And so we were almost like entrepreneurs as students, but it's that confidence piece that's hard to teach. I'd say it would be nice if maybe they got us out talking to audiences more, if that could have been integrated into that experience. Because you are always out there with your young advertising person or probably in any different role, you're the brand, you're talking to an audience and they need to have confidence in you. And to do that, you have to have confidence in yourself. Yeah, great answer. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today, Gwen. How can people get in touch with you? Sure. Well, the best way is to probably email me, gwen at gwenmorrison.com. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Gwen. Brian, good catching up with you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you, Gwen. It was really wonderful having you here today. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For more info, refer to the pod notes below. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a five-star rating and review. It really helps us grow. I'm your host, Jeff Roster, analyst at large. If you want to connect, follow us on Twitter at Jeff PR or at Brian Sathanation or connect with us on LinkedIn. Visit my website at roster.retail.com or brian's at edit.com.